Welcome to Getting to Know the University of Michigan. Today, you are going to learn about the program on intergroup relations. Before we get started, I want to invite us to take a deep breath because I know folks in the audience include first year incoming, first year students, parents, transfer students, and I can only imagine all that's going through your minds. So at this moment, I just want to invite us to take a deep breath because everything's going to be okay. Um, we're going to do introductions and then hopefully engage with y'all to gauge who's in the room. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we have to offer. Hello, uh, my name is Cesar Vargas Leon. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I currently serve as the senior program manager for the program on intergroup relations where I focus on partnership work. And my first interaction with the University of Michigan was in 2011 when my parents dropped me off for the bridge program. I'm a first gen student and let me tell you, I was very scared. Um, everything worked out though. It, 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 my path led to social justice through education and I'm really looking forward to supporting you all um, as y'all transition into the fall. And as I reflect on my personal journey, it's really easy to think about social justice. When I think about social justice, I think about it in uh, two levels, the individual and then the layer of being a social agent or a social actor in society. On the individual level, I think it's really important to think about um, self-preservation, attending to our basic needs and making sure that we're uh, functioning off a stable foundation. Um, I think the layer of being a social actor includes reflecting intentionally on our uh, privilege and marginalized identities, thinking about how we could leverage our privilege to help those folks who don't have the same advantages. And on the other hand, as we reflect on our minoritized identities, thinking about what skills, resources, and strategies do we have to develop to sustain um, the self-preservation on the individual level and on the collective level. I'll go ahead and turn it over to my co-facilitator, Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Beckett. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am tuning in from the Ann Arbor area today. Um, uh, my first sort of my history and my affiliation with the University of Michigan um, I was first introduced during a college visit when I was looking at universities. Uh, I didn't go here for my undergrad, but uh, a couple of years ago, I came to the university as the student experience team program coordinator here at IGR, the program on intergroup relations. Um, and I'm really excited about being in person this fall. Uh, I started my position just before the pandemic. So I only had a couple of months actually working in person with students. So I'm really excited for working in person with students, supporting them uh, and continuing to see their growth and also my own in this work. Uh, and growth in social justice is really, growth is just such an important part of the social justice journey. Uh, and I think on a really wide general lens, social justice is a lot about working to dismantle systems of oppression in our society. Uh, on a personal and individual level for me, um, that's about confronting my own privilege uh, and learning how to support the marginalized identities that I hold as well. Um, and then also working with others uh, for a more equitable equitable space uh, through, you know, love and compassion and resilience together uh, as we as we fight for equity. All right, so we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so for those of you who are tuning in live, or if you're watching this as a recording later, we want to take a moment to see who's in the room, so to speak. Uh, so in the chat, or just in a reflection to yourself, um, we'll go through some of these questions. Just we want to get you thinking about your social identities that you are bringing to the table um, as we start this presentation. So, where are you tuning in from? Pretty basic question. Whether it's maybe from your childhood bedroom, a local coffee shop, 
Uh, maybe you've moved into your dorm room and you're watching this in a couple of weeks from when we're recording. Uh, where are you tuning in from? All right, and next question we'll ask, um, are you a first year student? Are you a second year student? And then a little bit beyond that, are you a first generation college student? So you can put it in the chat or just think silently to yourself as well. All right, and then the next question to reflect on is how are you feeling about this fall? Stace and I shared a little bit about how we're feeling about the fall. We're really excited to work with students and support them as they continue to navigate these spaces uh, and really develop an internal voice. This as a first year or transfer student, incoming student, the university and college space is a real time of transition. So there's anxiety, nerves, excitement. Um, so all of those feelings are so valid as you enter into this new chapter uh, and really begin to develop that internal voice to be able to self-author your own life as you head off into being an agent of, of change in this, in this society. All right, and lastly, we want you to think about what social justice looks like to you. It's a big question, but what does social justice look like to you? All right, next slide. Why dialogue? All these questions that Elizabeth just posed are really important. And I can assure you that every single person tuning into this presentation, whether it be live or if you're watching the recording, your social identities are going to influence the way you experience your transition or this upcoming academic year at the University of Michigan. In the words of what, um, Rob Weiler, right, it, it, we, it, our intuition, if we observe, we could tell that there is a lot that's wrong with humanity and the state of affairs of our world. A couple of examples are the pandemic and how that has impacted folks throughout the globe, um, the outcomes and the results of politics, and not to mention, right? Like if, if we pay attention to our environment, I personally have uh, experience or had the privilege of growing up um, in, in a village in, in, in proximity to nature and animals. And, you know, like species are going extinct. Our, our planet is dying. There's, there's and, and what makes it even worse is that not everyone has access to the same quality of knowledge, resources, and overall information. And I think all this is very important to think about as y'all are transitioning into this upcoming academic year. So as we think about that transition into your time at the University of Michigan, we also want to provide a little bit of context into the atmosphere and the, uh, the space that you're entering in the state of Michigan. So whether or not you're coming from, you know, the state of Michigan, Upper Peninsula, Lower Peninsula, one of the other 59 states across the United States or from somewhere around the world, um, we wanted to let you know that Michigan uh, in 2017 was the second most segregated state in the whole entire country and the state with the fourth highest um, rate of hate crimes. So this is, the, this is the atmosphere and environment in which you are entering, coming into the state of Michigan. Um, and we see a real, a real need for dialogue because of these statistics. Uh, we see their importance in the classroom and in student organizations across campus, in dorm rooms, um, in the relationships that you're making with your peers or with instructors and faculty and staff, and across the country as you go on into whatever is next after your experience at the university. So what is the program on intergroup relations? The program on intergroup relations 
is an office, it's a joint partnership between the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts and Student Life. What does that mean? That means that we have the privilege of working with students in the classroom and outside of the classroom. The setup to this presentation was really important and it reflects our, our practice. For us, it's really important to have students and for us to continue on reflecting on the state of affairs, especially because it didn't result, the results didn't happen overnight. The results happened because of so many decisions that resulted in the misuse and abuse of power. So as students began to work with us, we really challenged them to think about what does it mean to be navigating um, in the Western, Western, Western Hemisphere? What does it mean to be operating within the University of Michigan? What are the dominant narratives? And how does power manifest as we are all navigating through society, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be in the dining hall, whether it be at work, whether it be in social spaces, social identities influence the way people experience the world. And it, it's, it's dialogue is a powerful tool. And it, it definitely changed my life forever. And I think the ability to orient oneself and really acknowledge how privilege and mar marginalized identities play a role in decision making is one of the most useful things that I've learned for myself. To give you all a better picture of how to differentiate dialogue um, between debate and discussion, right? So debate and discussion are the common means of communication that we're socialized within. Debate, for instance, you know, I remember almost my whole life, we fun I functioned off of wanting to be right, wanting to prove myself, wanting to collect um, you know, titles and credibility to make me feel like I held value. Whereas discussion, often, oftentimes it could seem very surface level. Whereas dialogue really focuses on people, on us as humans. Like what is our experience? How are we really doing? What, has, what, what was it like growing up, for instance, for me in Mexico? What was it like to transition to the United States? What was the experience of coming to the University of Michigan as a first generation college student? What were the struggles? And on the other hand, right, like being able to listen to the paradigms, perspectives, and experiences of other folks to help me learn more about what the world is really like. All right. Um, so as this are said, uh, communication and how we are communicating in dialogue is really important and it matters. And sometimes it takes a while to, you know, unlearn or retrain our brains out of this kind of debate and discussion type of communication into real dialogue. Um, and so I want to invite everybody to kind of close their eyes or kind of settle into a comfortable position for a little mini visualization exercise. Um, so first, think about a time when you were in debate with somebody in an argument. Maybe it was last year with the election. Maybe it was with your parents trying to, trying to get a later curfew time. How did that feel? Was your heart beating into, in the middle of your throat? Were tears singing in your eyes? Where was your breath quickening? How did it feel? You can open your eyes. For me, that's how I feel when I'm in debate or in argument, is I feel a very tense, my shoulders tense up, my heart is just kind of pounding in my throat and it's hard to swallow. And it's hard to even get words out or even know what I'm going to say because I'm in that heightened state. All right, close your eyes again. This time we're going to invite you to think about a time when you were in dialogue, some time when you were really listened to, whether it be with a parent or a best friend, your favorite teacher in high school. How did that feel? Was there a sense of calm, of relaxation, maybe even a sense of, of love towards the person that you were talking with? 
open your eyes again. Thanks for letting us uh, coming along on that journey with us. Um, for me, those are conversations that I have with my parents. I feel very heard by my parents. Uh, it's easy to have that come through because there's a definite level of trust. I feel that in conversations with Cesar as well. Um, there's just this sense that I am, what I am saying is valued and it's really heard by the other person. And that's the kind of communication that we would, that we aim for in dialogue. So there's a quote by a uh, US diplomat, Dr. Harold Saunders, who facilitated dialogues between warring factions across many or during many international conflicts across the world. And the quote goes, Dialogue is a process of genuine interaction through which human beings listen to each other deeply enough to be changed by what they learn. All right. So how does this work as we talk about the dialogue model or our practice? One of the things that um, is worth naming is that this is a choice. We give students the opportunity to sign up for classes or co-curricular activities to enter spaces where they're going to get a chance to engage with people who have different perspectives, different social identities. And um, one of the things that we are really good at is setting up environments and nurturing spaces so that folks feel confident and comfortable showing up as their authentic selves. And so what happens in our spaces is as we gain the trust of participants and as we gain trust as a community, we're able to have some serious dialogues about topics that we normally, that normally don't um, happen, which are at the, at the center of inequality and discrimination. And one of the, the, the ways we would like to explain it is by using this picture of the elephant. So in this, uh, in this illustration, there is an elephant and there are a couple of different people who are blindfolded and touching different parts of the elephant. One person is touching the tail and says, it's a rope. Another person is on top of the elephant and touching the ear and saying, it's a fan. Another with its leg, it's a tree. Um, so each of these people around the elephant are have one perspective on the entire whole truth. And they are an important piece of putting together that whole larger puzzle, which is really similar and a metaphor for dialogue because dialogue is about putting together everyone's stories and everyone's perspectives and truths into a larger truth that we can all understand. So perhaps when everybody takes the dialogue or the, <laughs> not the dialogue, takes their blindfold off, they can see the elephant, but as they were looking at this smaller picture, that was the truth for them, but they're working together to form a larger truth together. So what is the purpose of the dialogue? Honestly, for me, it has been transformative. Not only has it transformed um, my ability and my skill set to be able to facilitate and engage with folks that have different identities, but it also gave me an opportunity to humanize myself. I think that through my journey of being a first generation college student, I was really hard on myself. I got to the University of Michigan, was struggling, was an academic probation, and I'm like, whoa, everyone around me seems like is having such an easy time. Everyone is getting good grades. They're even finding time to go out almost every single day. And then this process of dialogue allowed me to reflect um, the fact that my experience wasn't my experience wasn't everyone's experience. What do I mean by that? As I reflected on my social identities, I started to make sense of why things were so difficult for me. One, my high school uh, was really underfunded. I had loving teachers and a lot of support, and as a school district, we didn't have as many resources as other school districts had. I didn't have tutor, access to tutors. I didn't have access to um, help to help me prep for the SAT or 
um, ACT. When I transitioned to U of M, those markers remained the same. I didn't know how to ask for help because I was the first one in my family to enter these spaces. And so that ability to dialogue and hear about other folks' experiences allowed me to learn about different strategies. Whoa, it looks like folks are, it seems like people are having a really easy time because they know how to ask for help. They've learned how to ask for help because their parents or their role models coached them through the process. And so that's one of the, one of the, one of the most liberating things about dialogue is that you get to humanize yourself and you get to learn about the world. Another really important purpose of dialogue is to examine how these social identities impacts our access to social power, privilege, and resources. So for my college experience, um, I was able to graduate and attend undergrad without and end the process without any student loans, which is a really, really uh, harsh reality for a lot of uh, a lot of folks, but I, examining social identity and how that has impacted my experience was something that I learned through dialogue. So in my undergraduate experience, um, I began to examine how my family had accumulated generational wealth because we were white. So my grandparents, although they didn't attend college, they had stable jobs and income that allowed both of my parents to attend college. Uh, and then as my parents navigated through college in their undergraduate experience, they were gaining institutional capital by knowing what it was like to be a college student. And so by the time it was for my brother and I to attend college, they were able to not only provide financial resources for us to attend college, but also that in, apply that institutional knowledge they had from attending college to then help us be successful. And then once I was at college, I didn't have tuition payments to worry about because I knew that that was something that was taken care of for me. Um, and so I didn't have to have a job on top, of my, on top of my schoolwork. And I really was able to focus my time and energy on schoolwork. Um, and so going through dialogue really allowed me to see how my privilege as a white person from socioeconomic means, um, being middle, upper middle class, uh, had really allowed me to go into the workforce without having my, my income go to repaying student loans. And instead I can generate my own uh, my own wealth and capital as I head into my future. And lastly, we want to talk about how dialogue prepares students to be agents of change in this world. Although Cesar and I shared very different stories about our paths to and in our undergraduate experience, dialogue is really not about dwelling on, oh, Elizabeth had it easier and Cesar didn't, and therefore maybe Elizabeth's experience is better. That's not the aim of dialogue. <laughs> the aim of dialogue is to reflect on why these experiences unfolded the way they did because of our social identities. And then with that knowledge that we gained from listening to each other's stories, what are we gonna do about it for the next generation or for the next group of folks coming into their undergraduate experience? How are we going to change that narrative of the existing systems of inequity and inequality in our society so that folks, it, so that identity doesn't have to be a determinant of how we experience our lives? And as an example, uh, Elizabeth, and I, Elizabeth and I are actually in the process of concluding a program that we're facilitate, helping facilitate for youth in the Detroit area. So the purpose of the program is to have students dialogue at the intersection of race and ethnicity and while keeping the context of why Detroit is so segregated. With the goal of nudging them into their agency to really think about what is it that I could start doing now as a high school student to start changing my community, whether it be on the individual level. Whoa, I have microaggressions or I perpetuate microaggressions I have these stereotypes about this group of people. 
whoa, my family believes in these norms or perpetuates harm in this way. What do I do about it? Or, oh, in my community, it, it, it looks like there's more liquor stores than grocery stores. What is that about? And is that something I could do? At school, it seems like a lot of my teachers are not conscious of um, social identities and how that influences the way students show up. Maybe it's worth coming up with the workshop for teachers. And these examples are actually truths. In the past, students have written books. They've changed policies in their high schools. They've um, organized protests and so much more. So again, the purpose of dialogue is not necessarily let's talk about it, let's orient ourselves, let's learn about injustices, but most importantly, what are we doing on the individual level and what are we doing on the collective level to make our world a more just place? So we've talked a little bit about what IGR is, what the program on intergroup relations is, what dialogue is, and we've even shared some examples from our both of our individual lived experiences, but we want to extrapolate it a little bit out and provide a little bit of information on some of the research that has been done with intergroup dialogue. Um, so back in 2013, a group of nine universities um, completed a multi-university study that compared intergroup dialogue with control groups in um, in how students were understanding their own social identities and the world around them. Um, and this study found that students who participated in intergroup dialogue had a better understanding of race, gender, and income inequality. Um, they gained greater intergroup empathy and developed skills in being able to empathize with others. Um, they had involvement in intergroup actions during college. Um, so coming together in an intergroup space with uh, various backgrounds and a di diverse group of people uh, and actually doing something together in a group. Um, and then also it resulted in post-college involvement in activism uh, or political action. And then there's a longer impact that we see in students who participate in intergroup dialogue. And as you can see from Cesar and myself, Intergroup dialogue really impacted us in our experiences. For me as an undergrad being exposed to intergroup dialogue and Cesar as he entered the professional realm with intergroup dialogue. This is something that we have dedicated our professional careers to. Um, so we are continuing to learn about our own social identities and how we show up in different spaces. Uh, and it's something that's an ongoing journey that we're committed to. As Cesar said, this is a choice that we make every day to be reflective and go forth in this work. Um, and we find that IGR uh, and intergroup dialogue students really walk away with a lot from these experiences that they have with us. And to contextualize like our practice, like how do we make it happen? So we have a model that we use that helps us facilitate the group formation process. In, in four stages, I'll go over um, the summaries, which is very challenging, right? So how do we name that we've been socialized around the modes of communication um, that center around debate and discussion, right? Like how, how do we take into consideration that everyone has been socialized according to their environment and their community and then dominant narratives? So in the first stage, we're really focused on building relationships and not just building relationships on the surface level, but building relationships in that we get to get to know one another on a genuine level. For example, like I've gotten to know Elizabeth on so many different layers, right? As a professional, as, um, as a woman, as a sister, as a cousin, as a community member, and vice versa. Um, Elizabeth has gotten to know me through my identities as a brother, as an uncle, as a community member, part of the, the Mexican community, um, as someone who identifies as a first generation professional. And, and so our relationships are not split in the public versus private. The first stage really focuses on 
who are we? Who are our people? What are what is our purpose? What are we passionate about? What are our struggles? What are we what excites us? What are our fears? And what do we look forward to in, about life in general? In the second stage, we start to extrapolate, whoa, it looks like there's a lot of commonalities and there's also differences. Why is this? So we use what's known as the psychosocialization to contextualize why that is that we have common experience and different experience as we think about social identities. As, as we gauge the difference in commonalities and we build trust and um, folks start to feel comfortable with one another, we actually challenge one another to show up and dialogue about hot topics. So what does that mean? Through activities, we actually prompt ourselves to think about um, times when I have been discriminated, oppressed. What are times that um, I have perpetuated discrimination or oppression? What are the times that I was a bystander of an injustice and decided not to do anything? And what are the situations where I witnessed an injustice and I actually did something about it? And so after we develop a common understanding that we all play a role into feeding into the cycle socialization and that it's not our fault, that we are not the ones that came up with um, these, these systems that bleed injustices. And we do have choices. And so the fourth stage focuses on where do we go from here? Where do we go from here on individuals to continue on living a purposeful life, right? Because social justice is an occupation and it's not the only thing we should be doing. And then on the community level, right? Like how do we support one another? How do we make sure that we're pouring into our community? How do we make sure we're pouring into one another? And how do we make this process sustainable? And then how do we digest and synthesize all this information and experiences and pass it on to the next generation? And so, for example, um, for stage one, I think it's, it's, for me, is one of my favorite parts of the group formation. I think I'm, I'm constantly learning from students. Um, I think the stories that we all bring are shine a light to the reality of this world. And so I think that uh, stage one comes with, with, with a lot of learning. Um, I've met students from all over the world. I met students um, who share similar experiences as I do, which have um, resulted in making me feel like seen and valued. And it, made, it has made me feel like I, I have a place of belonging. Um, and I, I have also learned from uh, people's experiences that I have an experience, right? So like traveling and, and you know, seeing the world from different perspectives. Um, and again, I think that's one of the most beautiful things about the work is that we don't see ourselves as experts. We see one another as collaborators and that everyone has something to contribute as they reflect on their uh, personal journeys and overall lived experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me in this first stage, uh, and a little bit in the second stage as well, uh, when I first entered into IGR, um, I was sort of intimidated to be working with all of these incredible social justice champions. And I began to notice a, a couple weeks after starting my position that I was really different when I was at the office and then when I was home. And I was so drained when I was returning home because I was wearing a mask at work. I was not really being my authentic self. And I was really struggling with these notions that I was socialized into of what professionalism is. And so after I began to build relationships, which is that stage one of the four stage model, after I began to build relationships and uh, create rapport with my colleagues, I was then able to enter into stage two where I was sharing and exploring more of how my, um, how my socialization was impacting the way that I was showing up in spaces um, and how my social identities had then impacted my socialization into, you know, what is, the, what is professionalism? 
And I think that white supremacy culture really had ingrained in me how you're supposed to interact on a professional level with, you know, trying not to be too personal or share information that wasn't relevant to the work. Um, and so that was a really kind of interesting and difficult time for me to really begin to chip away at the mask that I was showing up with at work and really build deeper connections with my colleagues and trust them with that information and that reflection. And then also welcome their reflections as they shared with me more about their lives. And so we were really able to seek some commonalities and differences in, um, in the work that we were doing together. And stage three is oftentimes, at least it was the most difficult aspect for me. I think that um, as a high school student and going through college, I was really good at dissecting and pointing out all the flaws of society and people. And I was able to, you know, intellectually talk about social justice. Stage three really challenged me to um, not only say, yeah, like the, the world is dirty, but my hands are dirty also. And I think for me, I recognize that um, for most of my life, one of the identities that was at the forefront was my marginal identity, which is a person of color from a low socioeconomic status. And stage three really challenged me to think about my privileged identities. And two of them that come to mind are being a man and being able, having an able body. I think that really challenged me to think about, whoa, like there is a lot of toxic things that I learned while being socialized within the Mexican culture. Whoa, yeah, the society that uh, continues to bleed and breathe patriarchy and imperialism definitely influenced the way I think about myself as a man. It definitely influences the way I relate to other people, the way I relate to women. And ultimately, this liberated me um, and allowed me to think about the next steps, which Elizabeth will talk about the fourth stage. So in this fourth stage, you know, the where are we going to go from here? Um, there's a lot of different levels that this action planning and the doing part of the four stage model can happen. It can happen on an individual level. Um, and that can look like, you know, doing the work, like reflecting on your own social identities, confronting the self, like how are your privilege, how do your privileges show up in a space with people that you work with, people in your classes? in your own family um, and to really, you know, sit down with yourself and think about your own social identities and how they intersect with each other and impact, impact your life. And then there's the more collective level that could be, you know, with a couple of people, a couple of friends, um, or maybe even on a larger scale. Uh, so I really like to remember uh, Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus who always says to take chances, make mistakes and get messy because this work sometimes does come with mistakes. And sometimes you may say something wrong that you don't intend to cause harm on somebody else. Um, so it's really important to be able to know how to apologize and learn from that experience so that it doesn't happen again. Um, one thing that I did during my undergraduate experience was I helped to facilitate a discussion with the student government. Um, there was a lot of uh, sexual misconduct allegations at my undergraduate institution. Um, and so we got a whole group of young leaders together and then did planning for what we're going to do about it to change the culture of our institution including enacting new policies, creating more support systems for survivors. Um, and this was one way that I worked in a coalition towards action and change. And overall, I think our hope is how do we nurture and create environments where folks can practice that growth mindset? How do we accept that we are humans and that we are imperfect? How do we build each other up? How do we do social justice from a place of love? One other thing about how we do intergroup dialogue at IGR is that we use a peer-to-peer -peer model. So in both our curricular and co-curricular opportunities, our dialogues are facilitated by students, by your peers. Um, we find that this is 
impactful for participants because, you know, one, they're closer in age. And so the experiences of your facilitators will be more closely related to your own. Um, you know, even though Cesar and I are a couple years out of our undergraduate experience right now, uh, you know, our concept of the world and, you know, knowledge of TikTok culture is very different than your own. So it's really helpful to have students who are have kind of just been through what you are going through. So it's more relevant to you to have facilitators that are closer in, in age to you. Um, and then they also have a real pulse on what's happening on campus right now. Like what's the student experience right now? Um, so that, that those real time experiences can surface in the classroom in dialogue. Um, and it's also a way that we address and name power dynamics um, because we're breaking away from the narrative of who has knowledge in our society, which typically may be held by the professor or the professoriate. But you know, now we're placing that power of knowledge into the hands of students because you have important voices and important contributions to share. And so we want to hold you in a place where you do have that leadership potential as a facilitator of intergroup now, of intergroup dialogue. So now, how do you get involved? So there's two opportunities. I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the co-curricular opportunities, and then I'll hand it over to Elizabeth. Um, so there's two ways you can get involved with um, Common Ground, or sorry, IGR on the co-curricular side. The first one is Common Ground. Common Ground is a peer-to-peer -peer model. So students help run the program. And the focus is to facilitate workshops for U of M students on any topic relevant to social justice. So topics on social identity 101, entering communities, navigating through power, um, privileged and marginalized identities, you name it. Um, and again, these workshops only happen one time. So you work with a cohort of students, a cohort of students, and throughout the semester by request, um, you prepare agendas and you facilitate the workshops for uh, your peers. And then on the other hand, if you have less time commitment, one of the ways that um, you could be part of the co-curricular side is by engaging with your student colleagues. And this happens in two ways, either through the student experience team or the recruitment team. The student experience team is, is really focused on how do we develop an authentic environment where students feel comfortable coming in, being themselves, talking about their classes, talking about what has happened in their social life or their personal lives. And the authenticity in that genuine community then sets us off to be able to retain and then ultimately continue on getting feedback on how do we as IGR improve the experience for students on campus. And that coincides with the recruitment team, right? Like for the folks who are all about their interpersonal skills and engaging with people and meeting new people, helping us recruit um, students to our office is also another way that you could be involved. And then on the co-curricular side, um, we have many courses that students can take. Um, so, First and foremost, we have a sequence of courses, starting with ALA 122, which is our intergroup dialogue course. So this is the course where um, it's a semester long course that is two credits that you dialogue on a specific topic uh, in a peer facilitated environment. Um, and you learn about that particular uh, social identity. We have race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, education, justice, gender. Um, and then we, our hope is that from that intergroup dialogue experience, you'd be interested in taking the next course in the sequence, which is ALA 320, which is our intergroup dialogue training course. This is actually has been turned into a mini course as of last year. So it's only half of the semester. Uh, it's a weekend retreat at the beginning and then four consecutive classes for the next four weeks um, on how to be a facilitator of intergroup dialogue. 
Um, and then from there, we hope that you actually put those skills into action with ALA 321, which is when you are a facilitator for the 122 course. Um, so you get a preference uh, or you get to have a little bit of a say as to what uh, dialogue that you facilitate. Um, and then you would have a co-facilitator that you are engage you are meeting with regularly and planning for your dialogue sessions. Um, we also through IGR offer a minor um, that includes more, more courses than just the three that I mentioned here. Um, but if this is something that you're interested in, we do, we are a minor granting program. Um, and so if you have more questions or want to learn more about the specific um, course descriptions, we have a QR code on the screen that you can scan with your phone. Um, and that will take you to learning about more about the courses that IGR has on offer. Um, there's also, uh, if you're interested in the community action and social change minor through the School of Social Work, um, many students kind of like to do either one or the other, uh, and there's an opportunity to take courses from either of those sections. All right. And then lastly, uh, how to connect with IGR or stay in contact with us. Um, if you have questions or like want general information, you can email igr.info at umich.edu. Um, and we will make sure that your questions get answered. Um, and then for more specific information about our courses, um, one of our advisors, Scott Wang, um, is an advisor for the program uh, and can get you overrides and help in enrolling in our courses. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also feel free to email Cesar and I and look us up on the M community. Um, but we wanna thank you all for tuning in live with us or watching this recording. Uh, we really hope to see you in our classes or in our workshops um, or just around campus. So thank you all so much for being here today. <laughs>